Lord Jesus, as we come together around your word now, would you give us a living moment of yourself? Bless us, Lord, and pour out your spirit. In your own name we pray. Amen. You may be seated, friends. Children are welcome to go to the solarium for their time together in Children's Church. The years that Cheryl and I spent living in the D.C. area, we were in Northern Virginia inside the D.C. Beltway. It was, it was so much fun. There's so many interesting spaces, some of the most amazing public spaces in the world, the Smithsonian and all these other lovely spaces. There are also, of course, all kinds of interesting, fun cafes and restaurants to go to. What surprised me, though, was the most intriguing restaurant cafe in town was not on the short list of where the tourists go. It's very possibly a place you've never heard about. It's not the old Ebbets Grill where we're told that the lunchtime deals get made and you go in and you sit and you look and you see what power broker might come in the door. It's not the pavilion of the National Gallery with the outdoor sculpture garden that's designed to give you the feeling that you're in Paris and, it's, and it works. It's a lovely, lovely place. It's not even my personal favorite over in Adams Morgan. It's not even teaism. Teaism, which is the best chai and bento box lunch you will ever find anywhere, and it's designed to give you the sense that you've landed in Japan. It's none of those places or any of the others that you find in the tourist books. It's a place that's really rather nondescript. It's had the same sign since 1960 when it began. It's not any good on social media or any of that stuff. It's simple, clean, effective, but it doesn't check the flashy boxes. It's called the Potter's House. The Potter's House is in a part of DC that I call an estuary area in American cities. It's in that part of DC where there are international diplomatic folks living just over there. There are recent immigrant folks living just next door. There's the inner city classic urban poor situation just over here. And your typical DC yuppie or professionals are just back there. It's kind of in a spot that's a meeting place of all these different layers of society. And yet the Potter's House, it's a place where you can go in and the lunch is homemade and it's either free or cheap, depending on what you need. It's delicious. It's prepared by staff who are formerly homeless folks who have found a place and found a job and got some vocational training and they're getting on their feet. It's a place where, if I'm honest, at least way back when we lived there, the coffee could use an upgrade, but the coffee was hot and plenteous. Maybe the coffee's had an upgrade over these years. It was also a place that had the best theological bookstore in the D.C. area. The kinds of books that if you went into your typical Christian bookstore, you'd have to special order. You'd go into the potter's house, and you'd sit, and you'd have lunch, and you'd look around, and you would ask yourself, how did this come about? In, in this city, in this city where people come to the city to fight, right? D.C., people show up to fight. They fight for whichever side they're on. Every four to eight years, generally speaking, there's a massive change. A bunch of people move out and a bunch of people move in. And we've, you know, the city's ethos flips from one side to the other and back again later. And yet, through all of that, through the civil rights movement, through the Vietnam protests, through 9-11, through it all, the Potter's House has been a place where you can go in and there's peace and there's calm and there's order and there's conversation and your soul can breathe. How did a place like that in a city like that come about? It came about as the project of a church just down the street, 
a church which, when it began in the 50s, was determined that they would put their effort towards being real, going deep, and being the body of Jesus in that space to which they were called. And so they broke a lot of rules. They did a lot of things that people said you can't do. If you're going to become a member of that church, you have to invest in a serious class that may even take a year to learn the culture and the ethos and the how we do things and the commitment level is high. It's an unusual place that has had unusual effect. Friends, as, as we're launched now here at Trinity and we're going forward, as I pray about us and this and what the Lord is doing here. What I hear him saying is, keep dreaming. Keep dreaming, asking me what I want to do, how much I want to do, what it is that I want to do. Don't be afraid. Don't hurry into how things work to make sure that they work. Be willing to break the rules. Be willing to do things in new, different ways in terms especially of who we are going to be and how we're going to get to that place that the Lord wants us to be in terms of simple, real, deep things. We've been walking in these, our first weeks, we've been walking with the earliest followers of Jesus, not because they were idyllic and perfect. We know from Paul's letters in the New Testament that they were not. If they had been, we wouldn't have had any letters from Paul because he wouldn't have needed to have written them anything. No, they had real issues. They had real struggles. But what they did have, and the reason we're walking closely with them, is they had a sense for how close they were to that moment of the resurrection of Jesus. And that moment, that single, unique, most important moment in all of history, in the cosmos, that moment, they still felt the ripples of that moment. And that shaped them. So the first week we were together, we heard how they had an unshakable confidence in God. They weren't scared. They weren't saying, oh, my word, the Roman Empire is going to pot. They weren't worried about, you know, how, how do we solve this moral problem? They weren't locked up in political expedience. They had unshakable confidence that God had moved in Jesus and God was moving, and God's work and his kingdom would bear fruit. And they put their effort into walking with Jesus. Last week, we heard a long but beautiful, powerful story of the way that the community of people close to the resurrection transcended all kinds of expectations naturally because it was the resurrection of Jesus that people were brought around. And we heard how it couldn't be easily put into any box or deconstructed and how it made ripples, personal, spiritual, psychological ripples, friendship ripples, social ripples, all kinds of ripples. This week, we're going to walk a little bit, just sow a seed on the question of how did they manage to go deep? What does it mean to go deep? In order to do that, we're going to take a quick look at one of the best places in the whole New Testament. The book of Romans is Paul's most developed theological book. If Paul had written a systematic theology, it would have been the book of Romans. It's as close as he got. And the book of Romans, I like to say, you know, the, the okay, uh, Southern Confession. Is it Zakim or Zakim, or how do you say that word? Somebody help me out here. Okay, good. The, uh, the others literally moved here, don't know either. That bridge down in Boston that has the two towers that it's built. Thank you, the Zakim. 
How do you get there? How do you get there? It's Zackham. It's oh, oh whatever. <laughs> that bridge. You didn't even know what I was asking. Wow, that's embarrassing. <laughs> Good heavens. I'm rediscovering my inner southerner these days. I don't know why, but it's just happened. I think it's springtime. You know, spring in the south is, is the best. So the Zakem Bridge, right, has these two towers, Romans 8 and Romans 12. The whole book hangs on these two peaks, these towers that the rest of the book is strung to and hangs off of. And in Romans chapter 12, Paul gives us this incredible challenge in verse 2. In verse 2, he says, be transformed by the renewal of your minds. And if you're anything like me, your inner person says, yes, please. Yes, please, no more imposter syndrome. Yes, please, no more tracks in my head telling me what an idiot I am. Right? If we're honest, it's what we do. So a year ago at Easter... A year ago at Easter, when we were all super locked down, I went out, I had, I had my GoPro on a, on a head cam, and I went out to do an outside sermon that we would walk folks through to kind of virtually let you out of the house, right? And I went to one of my favorite, beautiful, natural places on the North Shore, and to my own surprise, I got lost. I'd been there umpteen times before. I didn't expect to get lost, but I was thinking about what I was saying, and I got lost. So I went home, and I watched it. And I, this is an honest moment. To my embarrassment, guess what I found myself muttering to myself? I found myself as I was lost, muttering. It came through on the GoPro. I found myself muttering, you idiot, you've gotten lost. And I thought, I don't talk to anybody else that way. Why am I talking to myself this way? Be transformed by the renewal of your mind. I'd love to change that track. I'd love to change that, that mixtape. I'd love to change those messages. You're inadequate. It'll never work. Who else believes this stuff? Whatever it is, you know, whatever we've brought, God doesn't really love you. He couldn't. You're not worth it. Paul says, be transformed by the renewal of your mind. And we say, yes, please, I'd love to be. So how do we get there? Well, that's verse 2. Let's just spend time today simply in verse 1. Romans chapter 12, verse 1. Let's just walk with Paul in verse 1 a little bit. Paul says, I urge you, brothers and sisters, by the mercy of God, to present your what? To present, to stand with. Is, it's, a, it's one of those Greek words where they put two little words together. What are you expecting? To present your soul? To present your faith, to present your behavior. Paul says, I urge you, brothers and sisters, by the mercy of God, it's safe. You can trust him. You can enter into this. Remember all the things he's done for you in love. I urge you, brothers and sisters, by the mercy of God, to present your bodies. Isn't that amazing? It's amazing. Paul is affirming the body. Paul is saying your body is the space, you pardon it, embody, right? It's the, it's the you. It's the thing that carries you about. It's the you that people see. It's where your psyche and all the rest are located. And as we enter into a room, we give off all kinds of signals. Our posture, are we relaxed? Are we confident? Are we happy? Are we uptight? Are we scared? Are we wound up? Our face when we don't have the mask, you know, we're back in that space. Our eyes, our smile. And Paul says, present your bodies. He's affirming who we are in these bodies and all of who we are showing forth in these bodies. And he says to us, present them as a living sacrifice. A living sacrifice. There are times when following Jesus, am I the only one? There are times when following Jesus where you think it'd be easier, Lord, if you'd just give me a moment to heroically be martyred. Could I just have one big death, please, instead of these everyday little deaths 
that I fail at so much that are so hard to do. I think I could do better in an adrenaline rush. Just give me a good martyr opportunity, Lord, and I'll do it. But he says, present yourselves as a living sacrifice. As you live, understand yourself as one given over to Jesus. Giving up every other identity, the core root of who I am is a follower of Jesus. It's just what Jesus said it requires, isn't it? And Paul then even goes so far as to say, do this. It's yours. We translate as spiritual worship. Could also be translated as reasonable liturgy. Paul saying, it's just reasonable. Jesus gave his body for you. Did he not? Jesus gave the whole of who he is for us in love, willingly, voluntarily walking, even purposefully choosing to go to Jerusalem when everyone around him is saying, what are you doing? This is craziness. And he says, this is why I have come. And he walked into that for us. And he gave himself completely. And Paul says, you can trust him. Look what he has done. It's just reasonable. Give yourself, your body, your whole being as a living sacrifice. And Paul says, it's your reasonable liturgy. What is a liturgy? A liturgy is not a way to make people behave in an uptight way. That is not what a liturgy is. Liturgies are not only religious. I, I, I'm serious when I say I'm so delighted. I count the dogs every week. Because we need to be a little relaxed, even as we are participating seriously in a holy liturgy. You can participate in a solemnity without being somber. And a liturgy is a solemnity of a sort, but it doesn't unless it's a certain, you know, certain time of the year or a certain day when we're on a solemn theme. It doesn't have to be, excuse me, on a somber theme. It doesn't have to be somber. It can be a liturgy and be joyful and accessible and relaxed all at the same time. And as a matter of fact, in a lot of ways, it's best when it is. A liturgy is a bringing something into order walking into a space and time that is set apart to create an open space and time for the thing to which it's dedicated, to allow people to go deep because everything else is set aside and we've come into this space in which we have together become as one and chosen to join and to speak and to participate and to make the space the holy, good, deep space that it is. And what's amazing here is that Paul is giving us the opportunity that our very lives should be as a liturgy to the goodness of God. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine your life put into a beautiful sense of order and freedom? Can you imagine your life as a window of the light of heaven showing forth? Can you imagine your body, your presence, your persona, yourself showing up in the world in all the places you need to and want to and get to and have to show up in, and the love of God shining through, a space you are intentional about with a purpose, a space that isn't in charge of you, but you're in charge by God's help, by God's spirit of it. There's order, there's freedom, there's beauty, there's holiness, there's joy, there's life. This is what Paul means. This for Paul is living into the fullness and the wholeness of who we're meant to be. This for Paul would be authenticity for us, living into all that we are meant to be. 
It's an incredible privilege at the same time that it is a profoundly deep and costly call upon us. And Paul is saying, offer yourselves as a reasonable liturgy to God's presence and be transformed by the renewal of your mind. How do we get into this space? It requires time, more time than we think. It requires intentionality. It requires the support of others along the way, which means being real with them about our need for support and with what is really going on with us and how much we called ourselves an idiot this past week, or worse, called those near us an idiot this past week. It requires the Word of God and the Spirit of God. I've had this shoulder thing going on for the past 10 days, so I've had the privilege to spend five of the past 10 days in the office of Deborah Major. Some of you know Deborah. Deborah is a chiropractor. If Deborah knows when you go to see her, if she knows you and she knows that you too are a follower of Jesus, you will leave that building not only physically feeling better, but your soul will go out floating in a whole new space. And the other day, Deborah looked at me because I was really, this thing was the worst, honestly, it was the worst pain I've ever had. And I have a pretty high pain tolerance, I'm told. And this was the worst. I thought I was going to throw up. I couldn't, there were two days where I could barely work. I couldn't do anything at all. I'm doing much better. Thank you, Deborah. And thank you, Jesus. Right? But she looked at me and she could see how down I was about it. And she spent the last minute reminding me that she doesn't read. <laughs> she says, I don't read the hard parts of scripture. I just memorize the good ones. Now, that's, I'm not saying that's official, but it works for her. It does. And so what I want to do this morning as we begin to change our mixtape in our mind, to change the tracks as we begin to be renewed, transformed by the renewal of our minds, I just want to give you some of what Deborah did for me. She spent that last few minutes just speaking the good parts to me. And they just went in and like a sponge, right? So what I did was just for fun, I went to Paul's seven letters to churches. Romans, 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. His seven letters to churches. And I just went in and I just found the core truth for each one that the rest of it, you know, hinges on. I just want to read these to you. These are the kinds of things, friends. Memorize these. Put them in. Repeat them to yourselves. Call each other on the phone and just feel silly, but just tell them to each other. Text them to each other. Start to feed them in. This is who we are. This is the story we are living. Romans, we've been in 12, let's look at 8. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the Spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. You have received the spirit of adoption as children, by whom we cry, Daddy, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. 1 Corinthians, the future is sure. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. The trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we shall be changed. For this perishable body must put on the imperishable, and this mortal body must put on immortality. When the perishable puts on the imperishable, and the mortal puts on immortality, then shall come to pass the saying that is written, 
Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? Second Corinthians. If anyone is in Christ, there is a new creation. The old has gone, the new has come. Galatians. Because you are children, God has spent, sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Daddy, Father, you are no longer a slave, but a child. And if a child, then an heir through God. Ephesians. But God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. Philippians, I am sure of this that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion in the day of Christ Jesus. Colossians. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Dear friends, let's take a moment and come before our Lord Jesus in your own heart and mind, in your own inner space. Just take a moment and share with Jesus some of the mixtape that you normally hear, the things that you normally tell yourself about who you are. Imagine taking these in some form. Take them literally as a, as a tape, if you're that old or a whatever, and literally hand them to him. And watch them just dissolve into nothingness. Ask him to renew your mind in his truth. Ask him if there's someone that you might share those truths with, or that you might even risk sharing what this means to you, what it is that you've taken away, what it is that you've put in. Let them in, that other person. Come, Lord Jesus. Pour out your spirit. In your own name, Lord, we pray. Amen.